Hello, good afternoon. Hi, welcome to Black Life. Thank you for being here. My name is Chika Okoye, and this is... I'm Ryan Austin Dennis. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, before we get started, we want to acknowledge that we are, that this event is taking place on unceded Ohlone territory and just pay our respects to the ancestors of this land um, and all of our ancestors. So we'll just take a moment to be in solidarity with the struggles for native sovereignty and against colonization. Uh, with that being said, um, thank you so much for coming to this event. This is part of a monthly series called Black Life, and today is the first day that we have this beautiful banner, um, which has been created for us by an amazing artist named Jade Ariana Fair, who's right here. So this is the debut, and we're so excited and so pleased, and thank you so much for bringing this. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting to say many things. Do you want to? No, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then, yeah. So without further ado, we'll introduce Ramalika Imhotep, who's here with a workshop slash performance slash lecture, which is called the Cotton Patch. Yes. <laughs> have mic too, oh. Right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. It's it's on. Okay. Hey y'all, um, thank you for coming out. As they said, I'm Ramalika Imhotep. I'm a, um, I've recently begun identifying as a black feminist writer and performance artist. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, so this workshop performative lecture is me um, trying to like re-enter or reimagine a workshop I did as part of the Oakland Summer School in like I think it was last December, um, where it was just like I wanted to like do this experiment in writing and thinking about what it would mean to form like a collective memory bank and let that be the material of our poems. Um, and so, to, before I begin, I'm gonna play this lovely Nina video and then do some altar setting and then we'll keep going.
background I'm gonna just do my thing like whatever like Nina will just you know open the door um, but in a lot of like African dance traditions they talk about or have y'all heard of Pearl Primus or Primus um, but she's like f like a lot of the reason why we have kind of a contemporary West African dance contingent in the United States is because of the work that Pearl Primus was doing or Primus um, just kind of a foremother in this kind of like dance anthropology, um, but also like performance. Um, so one of the things she writes about is like this, how the spirit of the dance, like how in African societies, and I think she's writing most about like Western Africa, um, like dance is just a part of the rhythm of life. Um, and the dance is so spirited that when, it, when someone's really tapping in, when they're moving that energy from the ground up into the air to the sky, when their movements are in sync with the stories that they're supposed to tell, it's almost impossible just to watch. Um, and I think that like Nina carries that for me, um, even though like we don't, we think of Nina as like this virtuistic piano player, um, but also like there's just something so like spirited about the way she moves her body and the things that the movement allows her to tell when sometimes the, um, the other elements of the song are, are, are too tight or constraining. Um, so thank y'all for witnessing. <laughs> Um, so I put these two quotes up, and they're from the side of memory, which is kind of the, the text that I'm drawing heavily from today. And Toni Morrison writes, if writing is thinking and discovery and selection and order and meaning, it is also awe and reverence and mystery and magic. And then a lot later in the, um, a lot later in the essay, she writes, my single gravest responsibility, in spite of that magic, is not to lie. Um, and I wanted to use those as part of like my contextualizing myself um, here because I think that what I'm trying to do or what I'm seizing this opportunity as an occasion for is really integrating my creative and intellectual practices um, and to be able to say that I understand my movement um, through the academy, through like burlesque venues, because that's something I've been doing lately too, through poetry. Um, through essay writing and all the other kind of forms of production I'm currently engaging um, as kind of a commitment to this magic, to telling the truth, to telling stories, um, my people's stories, the stories that, that make me up. Um, up here on my altar, I have Phyllis Wheatley, I have my paternal ancestors in Georgia, um, I have Sister Joyce and Jerry Wills, who was an elder of mine who lived out here and passed last December. Um, and she's, she's like the most remarkable woman. Um, and she used to run a bookstore in Philadelphia called My Solitude. Um, and one of the things, one of the many wonderful things that would happen at My Solitude Books was this group called San, Asada Sankofa. 
and it was this black woman study group, and they were like super into Malcolm X, and Sonia Sanchez would come through, Tony K. Bambara would be there. Um, and so when I first moved out here for grad school, um, Sister and Jerry was a friend of like my mom's friend. And I would just go to her couch and she would tell me all these stories. And like when I was having a hard time, I could just run up the street and like take a soak in her bathtub. And it was just such sacred space. I mean, as I start to find myself in different types of study groups, another one of the things I do out here in the Bay is um, a study group called the Church of Black Feminist Thought. Um, Chica and I are currently collaborating on a study group called Black Liberation in the Erotic through the Oakland Summer School. Um, and I think every time I get further into that work, I can't help but think about Sister and Jerry and all the time I spent in her house. Um, and how that, like, I, I really honestly don't think I would have been able to get through my first year of grad school um, without those moments and without that kind of like little bit of refuge. Um, there's also Zora here. Um, because Zora is currently like telling me that I'm her child. Like she's like, you know, you thought she was gonna do this new dissertation and like you was into some new stuff, but like don't forget me. Um, don't forget that I am the one who told you anthropology was a thing. Like don't forget that I'm the one who told you vernacular culture was yours to know and own and understand. Um, don't forget that I'm the one who taught you language. So I feel like I can't do nothing in general, but particularly right now <laughs> without calling her in. Um, and I don't know if I talked about Phyllis Wheatley, but I've been thinking a lot about Phyllis Wheatley too as kind of this really complicated like black woman writer spirit who when I first read or was introduced to um, like her poem, it's like a poem being taken from Africa or something like that, I'm probably messing up the title. Um, but there's a way that you could read that poem and be like, oh man, like Phyllis Wheatley was, was like gotten like brainwashed. Like she's writing all these like really beautiful um, standard um, poetics, um, but she's describing like Africa in the ways that we've been taught to, right? Savage and like her pagan land, twas grace, like white supremacist grace saved her. Um, but I've recently been thinking as encouraged by folks like Drea Brown, um, who I don't know where she's teaching right now, but who's just like a really wonderful, like black queer poet um, and scholar. And then um, a colleague of mine from Berkeley, Sarah Johnson, to just like really complicate our understandings of what it meant for this little black girl to be writing um, in the time that she was writing. And one of the things that Toni Morrison does when she starts the site of memory is to think about kind of the constraints that were placed upon black folks who were writing in the 19th century um, and thinking about slave narratives. Because what the way that she's been positioned in this essay, um, which is published in 1995, but references the beloved manuscript, so it must have been published in the 80s. I mean, must have been initially like written or spoken sometime in the 80s. Um, she's just thinking about how her task is different because she's not writing with the same kind of like expectations or constraints. Um, and so all that to say, like I think Phyllis like is a genius, was a genius, knew of her genius, and really like crafted poems that could both protect that and also like enable it to reach more places. Like she wrote how she wrote so that I could buy that book at a bookstore in Boston. Um, I also think that Phyllis Wheatley's spirit intentionally pulls black feminists to Boston. Because if you start to think about it, like just a wild amount of like black women's rights activism and what we would now call like that whole like 80s moment of like black feminists, political activism, cultural production, and scholarship, like everybody touched a toe in Boston. And it doesn't make sense, because like, why? Like Boston is a really hard place. It's like really racist, really racially segregated, um, but something keeps making the currents go through. Like Angela Davis went to Brandeis University. That's so random. Um, then I went to Brandeis University, and not to say like I'm like in there, but like I'm in there, so you know. <laughs> It's like, and Patricia Hill Collins also went to Brandeis University. Uh, Hortense Spillers got her PhD from Brandeis University. And that's not even touching on the fact that like Barbara Smith and Demita Jo Frazier and all them were like down the street um, organizing alongside Audre Lorde and like, so something's up in Boston and I think it has everything to do with Phyllis Wheatley. So, thank you. Um, that's like the most important thing I'm gonna say today. Uh, <laughs> and, what else? And I think, and I was saying this a little earlier before I distracted myself, or before my ancestors distracted me, um, is that like writing is such a 
like everything, a lot of what we do in the world, particularly as folks who consider ourselves creative or otherwise like artistically inclined, like text has become such a, a presence. And I think there's a way that we can get bogged down in the drudgery of it, like those first things, those things that make us feel really in control, um, the thinking and discovery, selection, order, meaning, um, but that, that awe and that reverence and that mystery and that magic are the things that are a little bit harder to grasp or a little bit harder to convince other people of. Um, and when I think of like my literary ancestors, when I think of the kind of um, path that Toni Morrison has laid out, I think about like black women writers as being really intentionally invested in that magic and protective of it. Um, and I kind of felt like those were really good grounding statements for me to introduce myself. I didn't say that I'm a, I'm a PhD candidate in African American studies here, um, which I guess is kind of important. Um, but I think like I've been, I have a colleague who, who's like, you know, I'm, I introduce myself as my grandmother's granddaughter and like I introduce myself as my mother's daughter. And so I've been thinking intentionally about ways to like not be like, hello, I've been in this hellhole for four years and that means I'm credible. Um, <laughs> But because there's, I think there's something else going on here. I think even the reason I'm engaged in that kind of writing um, has to do with all this other ancestral magic. So, yes, that's me. Okay, and so now I want to invite you all to just like um, feel really grounded in your body, present. Like I won't um, ask you to do any specific posture, anything like that, but just take a moment to just feel in your body and aware of like, what parts of your body are hitting the ground or the stool or, or even like maybe how far the ground is from your body. Um, and then I'm gonna play this clip from the movie Beloved and like, um, yeah, just receive it. Like don't be trying to like make sense of it or like, like look for who's who, just like receive or witness. Halle bought baby Sooks his freedom, but Slavery done already busted her legs, busted her back, hands, everything. When she come here, she ain't had nothing left to make no living with. Besides her heart. Baby Suggs used to preach right here. Let the children come. <laughs> Let your mothers hear you laugh. <laughs> Let the grown men come. Let your wives and your children see you dance. Can we laugh? Like, can we just laugh for a second? And if you need to close your eyes, that's fine too. But just laugh. Like, even if you're faking it, like, what would your biggest fake laugh sound like? <laughs> and let it, like, 
like, let it be something you feel, you know? Like, laugh. Or at least, okay, let me just get one laugh that you feel in your tummy. Like, even if it's just a big ha! 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 <laughs> Thank you. What about a, what about a cry? Like, what is, like, what is your biggest, like, fake cry sound like? I don't even know if I have an answer to that. <laughs> I was like, Wah. Wah. I feel like I'm mostly like a quiet choir, so that's like a really strange activity. Um, how about a sway? Can we just sway? I feel like everybody's really cozy, so I'm not going to be like, and dance. But <laughs> let's just rock. <laughs> it's just rock. Again, just trying to create some space for us to clear, right? Um, in this moment, in Beloved, um, in, the, in the novel, in the film, which, like, people, like, I, rem I tried to have, like, a Beloved-themed housewarming party, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> or, like, I pitched the idea, right? And I made a flyer and everything. And my roommates was like, what? And I was like, no, no, it's fine. It's October. Like, it'd be great. Um, and then I was like, we can show the movie, and my roommate was like, you cannot just show Beloved at a party. Like, what? Like, nobody's trying to watch that. Um, but I think it's great. Um, I think if, an, there, if there's another one of my objectives here, it's just to be like, hey, here are the things I'm positively obsessed with. Know that about me. Um, so the Beloved film is one of those things. Um, and also the, the novel. Um, but so in this moment, uh, Setha, who's played by Oprah Winfrey in the film, is bringing her daughter Denver and her kind of like the, the, the haunt, specter, embodied, fleshly version of her baby girl, Beloved, um, who, according to like the legend of, of Toni Morrison's novel and also kind of the archival story, is based on, um, like Margaret Garner was an enslaved woman who got to freedom and when, the, when her masters came and found her, she decided that she was not gonna let her children um, return to their fate as enslaved folks. So she um, slit the throat of one of her children. I mean, there's so much kind of like lore around Margaret Garner, like around that case and the ways that um, in the kind of like archival record of her is one thing, but then the kind of popular dissemination of her image is another thing. Like there's a, if you Google like Margaret Garner, the photo you'll see shows like a darker skinned woman and a grown, um, like, a, like a grown um, black male child on the floor, which is a complete like obfuscation of what actually happened. Um, Margaret Garner was like also re recorded as a mulatto um, and like the child that she killed was a daughter, but there's a way in those, that moment and how to hold like the real horror of what this woman did. Um, she had to be cast as darker skinned. Um, it had to be a bigger child so that she was just a murderer, you know, like this idea of her um, finding an alternative route to, to, to protect the impossible innocence of her child has to be taken away from the story in order to make it sensational. Um, so, boom, Toni Morrison reads that, and because she's awesome and positively obsessed like me, she's like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna write a novel. Or you know what's happening, this novel is writing itself. Like, I'm, I'm reading this newspaper clipping, and the, the text is already there. Um, and then she says, like, you know, she, she was sitting um, outside her house, and she saw Beloved come and sit on the bench. And she says it like really dead ass, like Toni Morrison's not being funny, she's not joking. She's like, no, 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 like Beloved came out the water, she sat there and I was like, oh, okay, I'll tell your story. Um, so in this moment, which I think is kind of like um, one of the uh, major or most like easy to grasp instances of rememory, um, which is another like Morrisonian theory of memory um, that Beloved really is the master text on, um, Setha is just recounting the story of what she saw Baby Sooks do in this space of the clearing. And why I love the film is that, um, whereas in the novel kind of remembering um, is this recurring trope that like, that you could, you could dare was just like a, like something an enslaved woman is saying. Like, okay, you see your memory pictures, like that's just beautiful. Um, but in the film, like they walk into the clearing and in that last moment when Baby Sooks like, like winks or acknowledges Setha from the memory, um, that kind of idea of these pictures in her head still existing in the place. Like she walks the babies to the clearing, or she walks not the babies, the, her, she walks her daughters to the clearing um, and, and instantly all that is there, you know? 
the people are laughing, dancing, crying, weeping, that kind of communal, um, like exorcism almost, um, is happening in front of them. And I think it's also really interesting that like, that, set the, that, that was a story of importance to set the, um, and that like in the novel, the speech that Baby Sooks gives, like her, her lessons, the, the words that her heart speaks are all about kind of a repossession of the body. You know, she's guiding people, um, love your arm, love your neck, for they do not love it unnoosed. You know, like she's really kind of like giving a cleansing. Um, and I think I, it brings me a lot of juicy feelings. Like in our Black Liberation in the Erotic class, we're talking about like how texts act on the body. Um, and I think like reading that passage um, in Beloved, which everybody should read, or even like you could Google like Baby Suggs at the clearing, like what does Baby Suggs say at the clearing? Um, and it's just a really beautiful prayer, incantation, call for reckoning with black life. Um, and I think it just felt important to, to start there and to allow us to clear it together. So now what I wanted to do, and it's probably going to be a little tricky because, like, the screen is tiny, um, and so I, if it's, like, too far to see, or maybe I'll just lean on volunteers that are a little bit closer. Um, I pulled some quotes from the, t the essay, a side of, The Side of Memory, and I would like to invite us to just, like, have somebody volunteer to read and just spend a couple minutes, like, talking about what comes up or like what words or images are particularly evocative and like how that feels. I'm learning that that's just kind of a part of my facilitation style. <laughs> I'm like, mm, quotes, feelings. Um, but I think it provides a way, instead of me just being like, and this is what Toni Morrison said, and this is why it's awesome, which like I could do, but it'd be less fun. Um, so I wanna find a way for us to all be in it together. Volunteer. For me, a writer in the last quarter of the 20th century, not much more than a hundred years after emancipation, a writer who is black and a woman, the exercise is very different. My job becomes how to rip that veil drawn over, quote, proceedings too terrible to relate, end quote. So does that, like, or does that speak to anybody, or do y'all have any feelings or thoughts or questions? She's comparing it. Is she comparing it to Phyllis Wheatley? Is she comparing it? Oh. Uh, she's comparing. She's um, it's, it's different. Different from what? Talking about like slave narratives. So she's talking about. Um, she cites like Harriet Jacobs' incidents in the life of a slave girl, um, Equiano's. I, I can't remember the whole title, but Frederick Douglass, like, she's talking about, like, slave narratives and how they kind of were bound by a particular, like, there's all these moments in that literature where folks are like, oh, and it was so bad, I can't tell you. Or Linda Brent often is like, like, she has this whole thing where she's like, you, I hope you forgive me and don't judge me indecent and all this happened, and then she never actually says anything particularly pertaining to sexual violence or anything, but the, the, the mere suggestion of it in that moment was enough to make the text not worth writing. Well, this brings up for me um, the visual work of Kara Walker in our time mm. um, because she is ready to put out their images that she doesn't know whether they're founded or not, but they're like welling up from some kind of, um, whether it's unconscious or ancestral memory or channeling and, you know, she said in an interview uh, at one point, you know, like, if I can imagine these things, you know, that really scare me, you know, then I don't, I don't you know, I'm, and I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a nice girl, you know, like, well, what's going on here? You know, it scares her too. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, this makes me think of my, my great grandmother and some of like the elders in my family. My name is Akua. Um, and how like it's really, really hard to get their stories from them. Um, and most of them, they just don't, they just don't. 
share. And so I feel I'm also a writer and really concerned with um, ancestral healing and um, just personally and collectively. And so to bring stories forward in a way that can heal, um, I feel is my role. So I feel I relate to Tony and what she's saying. Like, well, you know, my great grandmother is not gonna tell her story because it's too hard, it's whatever. She has erased the memory even. Um, so yeah, so it feels like it's my job to tell stories like hers, like mine, like my mother's, and get my mother, maybe, to tell hers. Uh, so I feel that. Thank you. Anybody else? There's, there's a couple more quotes, so you know, don't, don't feel pressure. Yeah. And I'll just say that I also think um, black studies is obsessed with the veil, right? And a lot of it comes from um, Du Bois, in the souls of black folks, he talks about double consciousness as this veil between the, what the outside or white world sees and what the, the Negro knows himself to be behind the veil. And something about, and it was the first time it hit me like this, but when I read, like, my job becomes how to rip that veil, for me it signaled, like, almost the whole of what like black feminist critical thought has brought to black studies to say that it's not enough to say there's the way that we're seen in the way we see ourselves but there's something through that that's worth getting it that there's some merit to saying like no like i'm gonna be whole like when um zoro no hurston is writing their eyes were watching god and like is is kind of seamlessly switching between like registers of like southern dialect and just like beautiful prose Right, and I think there's something in the way that she does it so like shamelessly that is this like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bracket my my southern dialect. I'm not gonna make it seem like this is on one side of me and this is on the other side. Like no, there's this is a cross current that runs through me continuously. So my my text is going to literally flow through that veil, to rip that veil. And I think perhaps there's something distinct about a black woman's vantage point that does that. Um, and that's something I'm just starting to think about now. I've read Beloved dozens of times and I like part of what I what resonates for me is feeling like the idea of ripping the veil um, brings the visceral experience like you can I, I still cry every time I read the book and I think about Morrison's work as an artist and what she's doing that makes it not just like I'm telling a story about this thing that happened but I'm gonna make you feel it and at times it's sort of obtuse or there's this, you know, you, you're not entirely even understanding everything that she's writing in the novel, but there's this way that it becomes really visceral. And so I'm thinking about like what it means to be a writer and an artist and how the emotional experience of art does that and speaks to people in a way that just like recounting stories, well, I don't know. I don't know what the contrast is, but something about her work does that. Any takers? It's a long one. Moving that veil aside requires, therefore, certain things. First of all, I must trust my own recollections. I must also depend on the recollections of others. Thus, memory weighs heavily in what I write and how I begin and in what I find to be significant. Zora Neale Hurston said, like the dead seeming cold rocks, I have memories within that came out of the material that went to make me. These memories within are the subsoil of my work. But memories and recollections won't give me total access to the unwritten interior life of these people. Only the act of, imag of the imagination can help me. Thank you. Any thoughts or feelings or questions? <laughs> um, I mean, sorry to just do this, hog it, but um, I, I definitely, also as an artist, obviously, the, um, this piece around the, the subsoil of the work is really calling out or something, something about um, being able to 
hold a sense of place or a sense of memory or a sense of, of um, a people or a time that there's no, like you said, like the, um, those kind of more logical aspects of a writing process or a creative process, um, it escapes that completely. And like, what is it about um, being a black woman or having kind of a black feminist lens on the world and on my work that makes it so that um, like that subsoil can speak back to me and I can kind of have like, what is it about that position that gives me, um, gives me that trust, I guess. There's some, the trust piece also really spoke out about like trusting in what's kind of, what exceeds this one way of knowing or understanding the world. Word, 100,000%. And that's also why you're one of my favorite artists. <laughs> Any other things rising up? Yeah, I think like, I think also I'm stuck on trust in subsoil. Um, and I think part of like what came to me as I was preparing for this, cause I think I initially was like, okay, I'll do like the, I'll let this be my kind of like Church of Black Feminist thought, more burlesque side of my brain. Like I thought this would be like performance artist Malika talking to you today. But I think what happened when I was preparing was like, oh wow, like I really needed to read that. <laughs> or like as I prepare to like be in this transition where I'm like having to write things or like craft a dissertation project that like that serves me and doesn't just serve expectations. I'm thinking about what it means to just really lean in to that subsoil and say like, you might not get it right now, but this is like really spiritually informed and it's gonna be great. Like, it, or even if it's not gonna be great by some external standards, it's significant because something is moving through me that needs to be expressed. Um, and I have to trust my own recollections of, of memory, of how things work, of what things mean um, a lot of my more, um, a lot of the questions that I'm asking academically are about black femininity and labor. And like, what does it mean to have like a, a Southern vernacular sense of the black female body in work, performing different types of work. And so much of that is driven by kind of like little fragments of ancestral memory or thinking about what does it mean that like on the, um, like there's a, a story in my paternal line where like um, my great, great, great grandma and Valentine was supposedly like, like won the affections of, of the master. Like, like I feel like these stories are like old hat by now, but my family has one. I mean, because the love was so strong, even though he didn't claim none of the kids, he gave them some land. And like, um, we, and on that land, they built a church. Um, and that's a church that I spent a lot of time with and the church is like directly across from this field. And I remember my dad always being super explicit about the fact that like, yeah, that was the field where we worked as like tenant farmers. Um, but also like that's where we played and where we laughed and where we like learned things and figured out how to heal our cuts and different shit like that. So like I think there's something um, about what it means to trust a complicated understanding of like, like that's a story that's been told by black women writers. Like I'm thinking right now about a Gloria Naylor novel, um, not, is that the right name? Yes, Gloria Naylor novel, Mama Day, um, in which like one of the, the central myths is like this woman who bewitched, like who just has this tradition, oh, she bewitched this man and then like everybody's bewitching, the whole town's bewitched because this one like en enslaved woman bewitched this like master once. Hmm? Yes. Yeah, Chica de Silva, exactly, like these, these legends are everywhere. And like, what does it mean to like really lean into those whispers as evidencing some theory of black femininity and labor um, that I can't just find by like cross reading a bunch of like political economy. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. sorry, I, I, I'm gushing again, but are there any um, other thoughts and feelings that this quote is bringing up? Any takers? It's a kind of literary archaeology 
on the basis of some information and a little bit of guesswork, you journey to a site to see what remains were left behind and to reconstruct the world that these remains imply. What makes it fiction is the nature of the imaginative act. My reliance on the image, on the remains, in addition to, recolle to recollection, to yield up a kind of truth. Thank you. Ooh. Am I cool? Are you guys some feeling? Yes. <laughs> wow. Um, I feel like the previous quote and this quote and just it's really landing on me in a really weighted way because I'm also working on a memoir right now. And I also like have had trauma in my life that has like relieved me of a lot of my memories. And so there's this way that I'm like, yes, like I have to learn how to trust my memories that do come and, and construct the rest with like the support of ancestral knowing and like living people knowing, like talk to my sibling and like, you remember such and such what happened and people fill in what they remember and everybody's memories are true and not true. And I feel um, this really deep drawing to this idea of creative nonfiction and just like blurring those genre lines in terms of telling story as healing, as ancestral healing, in particular for black women in my family um, and for myself. So that when she says a kind of a truth, a kind of a truth is good enough is kind of what I'm learning. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. She also said in the slide before, the unwritten interior life of these people. Yeah, that really strikes me in terms of, you know, you got to go there. You have to allow yourself to go there because it's not, you're not going to find it in exactly in documentary form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please, come on now. <laughs> Um, I'm really interested and really stuck on the idea of the remains and using the remains to rebuild the structure. Yes. And I think what is so interesting about that, especially for us as black folks, is like our remains are so immaterial. It is like these stories pass through grandma and great grandma or like someone's brooch from 1920 that yes. somehow I still have in my hands however many decades later. It's yes. like, and how that brooch signals all these things about like a femininity that I feel but ne don't necessarily have access to every day. Yes. Like something about the, the like magic and the, the proportions of what's the remains and what is the guesswork. I'm really interested in that since what so much of what remains is like not necessarily on this material plane mm -hmm. and how that was, that's deliberate, right? Like there was so much that was intentionally destroyed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a thought that I'll <laughs> share as well. Um, I really, I'm thinking about, you know, this quote, but also the whole piece, which I've read several times as well, and how Toni Morrison gives this really creative and grounded reasoning for why fiction feels truer than nonfiction. And I feel like that's been true through my whole life. You know, it's just the, the truths that stay in the body or the characters that continue to live in my mind are generally fictional characters um, and uh, I really like this kind of, uh, I don't want to say justification, but this sort of support for that experience and I listened to another writer not too long ago talking about the way that fiction comes about because, you know, back in the 16th century or whatever, people telling stories needed to protect themselves from libel. Um, so people are telling true stories from their lives, but you change the names and the dates and the things like that so that you, know, you don't get sued. Um, and that you know, we can think about fiction in that way, that it is real. 
So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have so much percolating right now just as a response to y'all's responses. Um, but I, one thing um, that's really loud in my head is that I was just in Eatonton, Georgia for the like Alice Walker um, 75th birthday situation. And it was kind of surreal. It was like, what? Like, I was, like, one is Alice Walker's birthday and I am somewhere so near her, right? Like, period. <laughs> um, but also just like um, this whole town, like, so Eatonton, Georgia was also like, is the birthplace of Alice Walker and also of Joel Chandler Harris, who like, kind of most famously recorded the Uncle Remus tales and like just a whole legion of other kind of Southern um, folklore adjacent stuff. He used to work for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and before that he was working at another newspaper in um, Eatonton and he, he just like has just a really particular story. Like he's like, I won't, I can't even go there. But Joel Chandler Harris is in Eatonton um, recording these, this plantation lore. Um, and inadvertently, these stories, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear, Br'er Fox, um, are the stories that Alice Walker grows up on, you know? And that's not to like, like discount or overwrite kind of the really complicated paternalistic presence of Joel Chandler Harris, but just to say that um, I was in, I went to the Uncle Remus Museum and I'm in there and like there's this like black woman sitting in the back and she's been working there for like 13 years, Eatonton native. Um, and when we tell her while we're in town, she's like, oh, yeah, you know, Alice Walker was four years behind me in school. I'm like, what? So we, we're, like, all in all this stuff. Um, and then I asked her if she had ever read any of, like, Alice Walker's novels. And she's like, yeah. And then she starts telling me the story about how she played the color purple for her, um, she played the color purple for her grandma or, like, some elder in her family. And, like, in the first five minutes, she had to turn it off. And she was like, I knew that there, I knew that the story of Sophia, like that's my auntie, like da 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 da. But I can't till this day tell you what my grandma saw in those first ten minutes that made her shake it off like that. And and the grandma's response was something like, you know, that girl been listening to old folks talking and I'm put it in a movie. Like what what is this? Um, and for me, it like something about what you were saying about um, fiction as this place for fact. Um, and I really, like, I'm really into creative nonfiction right now. I've been thinking a lot about Saidiya Hartman's new work. Um, and every time I'm in a room talking about it, like, I, there's this really awesome um, Black Studies reading room happening in Boston, in Boston right now, <laughs> um, led by a colleague of mine, Giovanna Jones, who is at um, Harvard. Uh, but anyway, so she's doing this Black Studies reading room, and we're talking about um, beautiful wayward lives and beautiful experiments. And like everybody's like super concerned about is it fact? Like is Saidiya lying to me? Like is she drawing me in with these beautiful stories and getting me all emotionally invested and then she made it up? Like how dare she? And I think there's something here and in the rest of the essay, like this portion of the essay, where Morrison is like, you know, like I'm I'm not I'm not telling lies. Like I'm not even really invested in the distinction between fact and fiction. And Saidiya says, um, or Hartman says that um, fact is a, is a statement supported by the state or something like that, like that's really the difference. And I was like, what? Um, so yeah, and, and, and Morrison says that also, I think, in her own way. She's like, I'm not interested in fact and fiction, I'm interested in truth. You know, and the quote that I started with, like she doesn't, she says that she's kind of uneasy with the label of magical realism because despite of magic, like I, I need to tell the truth and the reason why I employ my imagination, the reason why I'm, I'm so um, desperate in my search for the connective tissue between these things is because of my loyalty to those remains, right? Because she understands it as like very deep work and she can't betray those remains. So even her act of imaginative fancy and like even her beautiful prose isn't to obscure or to make it different or to make it so pretty that it's platable, but it's just to get to a truth that is wholly unknown um, because nobody was, or because it was either deliberately destroyed um, deliberately forgotten um, or deliberately suppressed. I think Zora Neale Hurston is also somebody who's really invested in that. Like in Mules and Men, like the like the whole kind of folklore cycle she gets into is about folks in the South sitting on the store porch, like telling big lies. And telling big lies doesn't mean they just like are being like sh shady people, you know. But it's like a, a mode of of discussing, of signifying, of, of telling some universal truth 
um, but through the construction of a bigger world. Um, so yeah. Oh, this is a very long one, but just let Ryan Austin wants to read. Oh. <laughs> Get closer. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. sorry, y'all. Okay. The act of imagination is bound up with memory. You know, the straightened out Mississippi River in places to make room for houses. Oh, so, you know, they straightened out the Mississippi River in places to make room for houses and livable acreage. Occasionally, the river floods the, these places. Floods is the word they use, but in fact, it is not flooding. It is remembering. Remembering where it used to be. All water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. Writers are like that, remembering where we were, what valley we ran through, what banks were like, uh, what the banks were like, the light that was there, and the route back to our original place. It is emotional memory, what the nerves and the skin remember as well as how it appeared. And a rush of imagination is our flooding. Tony Morris and everybody. <laughs> we can all go home now because, like, what do you do? Um. <laughs> yeah, thoughts, feelings, questions? Hey, Delphine. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess for me, I guess like all water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. It's like, what does that mean for black, you know, what does that mean for black folks? What are we returning to? Mm -hmm. um, and like thinking of, a, yeah, what is that perfect memory that we're trying to get back to? And is there a getting back? Um, yeah, that's just like, yeah, it's just it's a lot to hold. Um, and I actually, like, I think it's okay for us to hold it because have an activity where we can... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, do y'all have, like, paper? Or like writing utensils. I don't have writing utensils, but I do have some pieces of paper. Okay. Okay. Awesome. But I have this here. Oh, the most fun part. I don't know if I have enough like little like prompt things, um, but we'll figure it out. You can just pass the um, the basket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is going really well, guys. Thank you. is, ooh, sorry y'all. Um, the exercise is to write about um, when did you first learn to blank, and the blank is whatever your little piece of cotton says. 
Um, and like free write, don't feel free to like write. It could be a list, it could be a story, it could be anything. Um,
Frage. Aber You can start to wrap up if you haven't already. Just put closure on your thoughts. We don't get along, me and this thing. It keeps getting. All right, so um, here's, this is a bit of a choose your own adventure moment because there's a way that I did this the first time, um, and then I'm, but I'm open to you know finding a, a sharing strategy that suits your needs. Um, but so the first time I did this, I collected them all, and then we kind of just like randomly would pick one and then read it, like. Somebody would, so you would read somebody else's memory and we would just kind of have this moment of just like fill, filling in the river, like putting all the memories in the river, um, but not necessarily feeling like it was like this memory is representative of who I am and I'm putting it in the river because that's not really the point. Um, so we can do that. I can come with my little basket, you put your memory, and then the, you'll, we'll pass the basket a couple times and just read them. Um, we could also do like partnered sharing and then just do kind of like a general, more general reflection at the end. It would do like five minutes of just sharing with the person near you um, and then talk about it later. Or you can just share your own memory to everybody right now. But I feel like, I don't, I don't feel like that's what y'all wanna do. Um, so A or B, like partner sharing, boom. Um, so all right, let's take like five minutes and just like pick someone near you, or it could be a, a duo or a, a three, yo, threesome. <laughs>
Um, how much more time do y'all need for everyone's voice to be heard? Like two minutes? Okay. like a minute left oh. <laughs> we got like a minute left on the clock so be closing thoughts you know Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. How was your swim? How's the water? Good. Does any, do y'all have any just like reflections or feelings or how was that? Is it like Oprah? <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes. I asked for permission to read the person sitting next to me's version, because it was her first draft and it sounded like a polished draft, but I did ask permission, so if you don't mind. So she didn't realize she was supposed to follow the prompt on the heart, so she made the question, when did you first learn you were a poet? Okay. When my Aunt Rose wrote poems on holiday cards and read them to me, when I heard her stories of her struggles in a Yiddish-speaking refugee family, when the light spoke to me telling me that God is everywhere and that we're all meant to speak the truth, when I discovered Marianne Moore's poem, What Are Years, sorry, and memorized it, when I discovered Poetry Magazine at 11 years old and discovered that the rocking chair in my room held the secrets of the universe, when the cantor in my synagogue bowed in four directions and in his deep-throated, deep Deep believed brilliance took 20 means to sing the Alenu. When my mother was lifted out of the car and put into a wheelchair, bandages wrapped around her head, and handed me a doll she had knit in the hospital. I was four years old when an abusive caretaker took me to her church, telling me that I was a sinner because the Jews killed Christ and I smelled the incense. So. Not really a memory, but we were kind of talking about parenting and childhood a little bit. And that kind of all came to, came about. Like um, Ruth, you were talking about, if, if I may speak, like this idea of like when you were a kid, like your mom would wash the dishes, and you would want to wash wash the dishes like just like her. And how kind of responding to that those notions of like kind of adulting, being an adult, but also thinking about femininity and trying to like encapsulate that. So that was kind of interesting and imitate, yeah. And then, Nan, you had this story about, like, making a big break with your family, with your sister, you said. Like, you said, like, I'm just not going to talk to them for, like, you know, five years, you said? Yeah. 
and like how that was like a big instance of no, like, um, so this seemed like, and, and mine was like about another weird family thing where my parents gave me the option. I had done something as a, as a kid and I wanted a Power Ranger toy and they gave me the option of either getting the toy in a whooping or not getting the toy at all. And so I chose the toy and the whooping. And so, and it's like this thing in my life, it's like, and we were just talking about like, what does that mean when you get these options, like, you know, and how those play out in your life as an adult. So, like, yeah, yeah. So, it's some deep shit. I, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for this exercise. It was really enjoyable to do. Um, I don't normally speak a lot, but I kind of feel like reading mine, even though I might have lost it. No, I think it's, it's, oh, it's hiding like I normally do. <laughs> um, my prompt was, when did you first learn to pray? Um, my earliest prayer memories of praying were before my family and I ate dinner and before going to sleep. In my family, we would thank God for the nourishment provided on our plate and for being thankful for being able to be, eat together and for our family near, far, and on the road. My favorite part was when we took turns after the prayer to say one of our favorite scriptures or Bible quotes that moved us. I always love, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think as a kid, I took it as a scripture that gave room for all people, including freaks. Whether you were a Christian or not, as long as you had a kind heart, you were going to be okay and invited to go to heaven is what I took from it and that always kind of settled me as a kid and made me feel like things were going to be okay thank you that made me... Sorry. thinking about prayer like when you first that was like I was thinking about like night prayers yeah. I forgot about that like I you made me remember like I used to do that as a girl <laughs> I used to pray. I, I used to pray, like, and would have a sense of devotion towards it as a kid. Like, I would do my night prayers and I would go to sleep, and like that was such a like. Thank you for that. Like that was such like something that was like oh. Yeah, yeah. I just think that's really true and really revealing. Kids do that and they're really sincere about it. It's very real, it comes from a very pure place. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's, that's all I can say, yeah. Um, yeah. I was just gonna say like, um, setting intention, prayers, like that's really deep because um, like they said with the kids, they like, it's no fear almost. It's just like, you know, they're an open vessel. And so, um, yeah, was, I, I didn't have like a full connection. I grew up in a religious family in the South, um, Alabama, and um, I didn't really understand religion, but I always knew that I had a connection with some source. And I would always say like, oh, I can go to church in my bathroom, you know? and um, but yeah, it always, something was always there. And so that was like beautiful. Um, yeah, the children and yeah, it's like deep. Yeah, they're like open. They're like an open vessel. Thank you. Anything else bubbling up? Uh, I'm not gonna read mine. I'm not gonna remind. I got, I got, um, when did you first learn to heal? Mm -hmm. Which was really poignant for me. Um, but I was really struck by like what the two people I was sitting with got and how I intersected at um, when did you first learn to clean? And like when did you first learn to wash your ass? <laughs> and um, I'm sorry, what's your name, friend? Peter. Peter. Peter talked about um, uh, living with, growing up with a black domestic woman working and cleaning up after him and um um Cassia 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 talked about um her older sibling teaching her in the bath to like you know um just you know wash your ass last face first ass last <laughs> um 
And so all of that just like really brought me to my grandmother who worked, worked as a black domestic for most of her life. And um, t I lived with her and she's also a Virgo, if you know about astrology, just like very meticulous person. So I learned how to clean from her. And I was thinking, and I, myself, my body, and the house, and whatever needed to be cleaned. And so I was thinking about myself in the middle of these two people that were sharing with me, and I was sharing with, and like, you know, Peter was like, I kind of still don't know how to clean. <laughs> and I was like, I know how to clean better than you know how to clean, because I came from. So I was just like, <laughs> like really sitting here with the, like the legacy of these black women who cleaned all these people in their houses and took care of them as they was dying and cleaning them still and like yeah i know how to clean like that yes <laughs> That's thank <wild>. you <laughs> thank you wow well thank y'all so much for for flooding and for inviting us all into your waters um I'm going I'm to read some memory poems, and then we'll conclude. Is that all right? Okay. Oh, I guess I need the microphone. You can pop it on the stand if it's like the best one. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this first thing I'm going to read, I didn't even really like was actually a memory exercise. Like I was having this moment and I was like sitting on my floor and I was really missing um, this woman named Miss Graham who was kind of like my, like my uh, biological grandmothers had all passed by the time I was born. Um, but Miss Graham was like a sister friend of my mom who kind of like was that for me. And so I was sitting down and I was really missing her. And I was like, I'm gonna write about this memory I have. And then I read it the other day and I was like, okay, you better write. <laughs> So now it's a poem. Ms. Graham say, one day the children ask why grandma always sitting on the porch with her legs wide open. And the grown folks answered, she keeping the flies off her watermelon. And I can see her clutching her knees in a fit of laughter, the curl of her smile, eyes coy in their gentle humor. I laugh before understanding the punchline, this funk, the open leg bait, Grandma's body, a living thing, its organisms courting other bodies, a sweet lure protecting her fruit. We negresses always smelling ourselves, dousing the heat and talc fit to kill. I smell my mother as she braids my hair and say nothing. Acquire a taste for my own funk as I lay depressive, avoiding water. Pheromones leak through tufts of soft hair. I am delicious, seated, ripe pink flesh. I squat in front of the wedge and smile wet. Smile, face wet, whoop, face wet with the cool sweetness. That was about watermelon, not <laughs> vagina, I promise. <laughs> Maybe I thought it was about watermelon, but it just told me what it was actually about. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Okay, and this poem that I wrote intentionally as a poem is called Home is a Mouthful of Spit for Your Tender Heart. One, the humidity moves into my skin and breaks up all my English. The words start dripping from one to the next, seem like my tongue get fatter when I'm back home, won't move round fast enough, can't pick up the right syllable, just lounge round my mouth, pulling up too thick saliva, I spit out the side my face like all the niggas I used to watch pose around the corner store, and all the niggas that came before them who shot craps against that same wall talking shit like it's syrup. A young black thing, pretty like me on a good day, walks by and that spit turned to steam, creep up the back of thighs that wouldn't normally be exposed this time of year, but this a Georgia winter. And when my mama first moved down here, Sagittarius as she is, they barbecued on her birthday. All that New York just melted away and her English started to break too. Soon she started to move in like them Augusta women her folks ran north to get away from. Two, in the kitchen we laughed through a joke about how I'm sounding like I'm back on somebody's plantation. 
And she let on that she noticed, but say that whenever I do decide to speak English, I speak it good. So good she turned to dictionary trying to follow where I'm going. Say I be using them words in new ways with new folks rules. Then come home and melt all them semantics into something slow and sloppy. And in my voice, I remember stories that ain't all the way mine. Three, how everything I know about sound and poem come from up out red clay and get stuck underneath my tongue. How we wash the headstones white with our mouths full of laughter and ain't that how we mourn. How my daddy's sister used to keep dolls on her bed just like I do and ain't that how you put beauty to rest. How they used to fill cuts with cobwebs and ain't that where all the wisdom come from. How spit is good enough medicine for anything on the surface. And ain't that why it pull up at healing time? Um, and this last one is about or was inspired by um, another Toni Morrison novel. So it's not really a memory poem, but like it's Toni Morrison. So, you know. Um, and so jazz is like super beautiful. And if I had to have a, I, I'm not even going to do that. Anyway. Jazz is a great novel. Um, and recently, Nambi E. Kelly, this like black woman playwright, did a staged adaptation of it. Um, and it was showing in Marin, which is like this really weird theater house in Marin. But like they show really cool like new black plays. So like if you want to see like a experimental black play, like randomly search Marin Theater Company and like they might have something for you. Um, so this is called Mammy Made Potion. Um, Violet spreads herself crimson between the legs of a young promise. No babies, just city slick sweet talk in the rush plummet of a chosen love. Daughter aged girl, hot beneath her sash, chasing death right out an old woman's bed. And here, the would be baby falls into a suspension, a less than nothing saturating the chest of annoyed lovers. And in the change ain't no more choice. Mother hunger rolls itself out from behind memory. A daughter's longing to forget. The mother's body cramped in the damp narrow of a well, bleeding into all the water. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now, but thank y'all so much for just being on this wild ride with me. Um, low, I guess technically this is like Q&A time, if y'all have like Qs that need As. Um, but like also, I'm just really, I'm really, thank you Chica, thank you Ryan Austin for the opportunity. Thank y'all for showing up. Thank you Jade for this, like this is, yes. Um, and thank you, Dave, like just thank y'all, everybody for, for being a part of this moment and being able to witness whatever just happened and take, I hope you take some of it back with you. <laughs>